All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And welcome to this update on farm workers and the COVID-19 crisis. We are currently using the Zoom webinar format and only those people who are attending as panelists will be speaking. Just a little bit of housekeeping to get out of the way. In a moment, I will turn things over to His Worship Mayor Drew Dilkins to introduce our panelists joining us today. A reminder that participants must turn your microphones and camera on and off using the Zoom buttons in the bottom left corner of your screen. Panelists, please ensure that your camera is enabled for the entire session, but only turn your microphone on when speaking, please. For our media in attendance, we have a planned Q&A period after opening remarks and updates from each panelist have concluded. Please use the chat function in the Zoom screen to request a question. Once the panelists have finished their presentations and discussion, I will call on you to ask your question and your microphone will be enabled. Thank you everyone for your attendance and participation today and thank you for your willingness to use this technology. I'll turn things over to Mayor Dilkins to start us off. Go ahead, Your Worship. Well, thank you very much, Dana, and good morning, everyone. I'll begin by welcoming the regional leaders who are participating as panelists today, and we're here to provide uh, an update and, of course, to have a discussion around the ongoing local COVID-19 public health crisis within the farm worker population. We're discussing the need for greater coordination and support from federal and provincial emergency management officials. And today I'm joined by Gary McNamara, the warden of Essex County and the mayor of the town of Tecumseh. Uh, Hilda McDonald is with us, the mayor of the municipality of Leamington. Nelson Santos is here, the mayor of the town of Kingsville. Dr. Ross Moncour is on the call, CEO and chief of staff at Erie Shores Healthcare, and David Mouche, who is the president and CEO of Windsor Regional Hospital. Thank you all for being here with us today, and thank you uh, all for being strong leaders. You've certainly shown strong leadership uh, in the community during this very, very difficult time. And I know that each of us, on a daily basis, we're certainly facing decisions with far-reaching impacts, and sometimes the obstacles in our way seem insurmountable, but, but you're all doing a, a great job, and I appreciate you making the time to be here together. Uh, and that really is what we are. We're here together, and we're facing the situation together, and that really means something. Uh, and in the early days of our response to this pandemic, I said that our community and society will be measured by how we support those most vulnerable amongst us. I said this as we began to see significant increases in positive cases of COVID-19 amongst those experiencing homelessness in other communities, and as long-term care homes began experiencing outbreaks. In Windsor, we knew this virus would hit our region's vulnerable populations hard and that they would face extreme challenges and of course, increased risks. In late April, the province ordered the testing of all residents and workers in long-term care homes. So we tested the long-term care population and David and his team set up a field hospital for the sick. In May, the Windsor-Essex Public Health Unit required the testing of Windsor's homeless population and other congregate living settings. So we tested the homeless population and we set up a recovery uh, center and an isolation center to help those who needed support uh, who tested positive and we did that. And at each step of the way, we acted to save lives. We made critical investments in isolation and recovery centers. We funded initiatives. We built new partnerships and leveraged existing ones to make a difference where it was needed the most. And little by little, Day by day, we made progress into stage one of the provincial reopening framework, and then we were held back as much of the province entered stage two. And the province at that time cited the localized outbreaks of COVID-19 within the temporary foreign worker population. This was another vulnerable population, one integral to our regional agri-food industry and to Canada's food supply chain, and they certainly needed our help. And we knew that increased tests were needed, but were difficult to accomplish. And we knew that living conditions uh, and many of these farms were unacceptable and they were putting lives at risk. And we knew that the virus does not discriminate. So as the situation progressed, Windsor was cleared to enter stage two, but we were forced to leave Leamington and Kingsville behind. And as someone who has insisted we rise and fall as a region, that was certainly a difficult pill to swallow. So Windsor City Council took immediate action to help, through, help us through the expansion uh, and, and we expanded our isolation and recovery centers for COVID-19 positive farm workers, extending our protocols to Essex County farm workers. And we did this to help slow the spread within our community. And I added my voice to those calling for full testing of the temporary foreign worker population. These are the workers, these are people who are here who have traveled from thousands of miles away, who face incredible challenges when seeking health care. There are language barriers as well as concerns about their economic security. And they are here to do jobs that are vital to our economy and frankly that no one in Canada wants to do. 
Uh, and so as the Mexican government issued a travel advisory to say that Essex County was not safe for their citizens, we got on the phone with the premier, the agriculture minister, the federal minister of health, and the deputy prime minister. We heard important acknowledgement that this was a crisis and that this crisis would need help from all levels of government to support our workers, safeguard public health and safety, and support the agricultural companies who are vital to Canada's food security. So I've continued to fight and advocate for our neighbors in Leamington and Kingsville because we need to stand up for our entire region, which means standing up for every person who calls this region home. People are stepping up to help and that will make a difference. It certainly will, but this fight is far from over and this battle is a big one. It's complex and that's the message I really wanna get across today, that our success will not always be measured by how many days in a row we make it without a death due to complications from COVID or by the number of positive cases in our community. Our successes will be measured by how we work to address complex situations that impact our economy, our city, our towns, our province, our country, and most importantly, the health and safety of our people. And I think I can safely speak for everyone on this call here when I say that we will continue to advocate for federal and provincial support for increased testing of our farm worker population, expansion of isolation and recovery facilities in our region, and of course, improved living conditions, including a longer term plan to address housing for migrant workers. And very important, we need the province of Ontario to step up and take a lead in coordinating the on the ground response in Windsor, Essex. We have asked the Provincial Emergency Operations Centre to come down and lead the effort to overcome the obstacles that remain. And I say this, and I, I certainly don't wanna leave anyone with the impression or the thought that somehow this request is an indication that our local efforts have not been robust. There are many people working hard and doing great things, but this is a very complex issue involving two higher levels of government and a lot of moving parts, which is why we have requested the province to lead the response effort to ensure coordination among all partners. And so all around us, there are voices, including ours, calling out that we must do better. And today is an opportunity to provide an update on what's been done, what's still left to do, and how we can support one another through it together. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to the Warden of Essex County, uh, Gary McNamara. Gary, thanks for being here today. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Drew. Uh, you've hit the nail right on the head. Uh, uh, you know, together now more than ever, it is critical our leaders work together so we as a region can address this very complex issue. The surge of COVID-19 cases in the agri-farm sector is occurring for multiple reasons and is not certainly not the fault of any one particular group or certainly not the fault to the workers. The work being done on these farms is essential. Uh, providing food for residents in Windsor, Essex and beyond, ensuring crops are harvested, processed and shipped to market, that the supply chain remains intact is crucial to our health and the well-being of also our economic sustainability. The problem is one that is the most complicated one facing us right now. As my colleagues around the, this table are aware, it can only be addressed through creative approaches and collective solutions. As with the COVID-19 crisis in long-term care, we swiftly moved into action under the guidance, Windsor Essex County Health Unit and the support of uh, the Essex Windsor EMS and health partners at this table, we quickly moved to protect the most vulnerable in our, in our region. We have moved into action once again, yet this time our response involves a greater number of complexities. And with that, a greater number of organizations working together including Ontario Health, uh, the OGVG, uh, provincial ministries, the federal government, and, and certainly more. It's critical that these workers understand that they have access to assistance, access to health care, access to support. And make no mistake, there is more still to be done. And we need to continue to press forward and we will need additional support. As you alluded to, uh, Mr. Mayor, in terms of the province and, and a, a, a greater coordinated effort from, from our upper orders of government. We cannot relax our efforts as the virus does not rest. Our farmers, our workers have been laboring under extremely stressful conditions and I'm confident our multi-pronged, multi-government response will provide them now uh, with the supports that they need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Warden. Appreciate you being here today. Up next, uh, Leamington Mayor Hilda McDonald. And Hilda, you recently 
uh, made a very powerful presentation to the Honorable Patty Haidu, Federal Minister of Health, about the crisis occurring in Essex County. And you spoke about how residents in your own town uh, were terrified of coming in contact with farm workers for fear of community spread of COVID-19. And I know how much you were doing for your residents. I know how much the community means to you. And I want to thank you for joining us today for updates from Leamington. You're welcome, Mayor Dilkins. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, I, I just want to clear, clear up a couple of things, if you don't mind, before we start. I don't have a prepared text. I just want to highlight a couple of points. So the workers themselves are, if you're talking offshore, there are two categories, the temporary foreign worker who tend to stay the two-year program, and then there's the seasonal agricultural workers who are here about the eight months. And then we have local folks as well. And I think you're quite well aware that there are people that come in daily from the city and the rest of the county to work in the greenhouses. So, so when we're talking about agricultural workers, we're talking generally about all of them when it's the, the workplace setting. The congregate living are the temporary foreign workers and the seasonal agricultural workers. I, I think there's oftentimes um, miscommunication and a misunderstanding there. And then I also want to clear up something else. I've lived here all my life, born and raised for close to 10 years. I worked in the uh, greenhouse industry for a, a cooperative in human resources. So I, I know lots of these folks. I know that I knew the grandparents. So anyway, not every farm has the deplorable conditions that we are seeing forwarded on social media. In fact, I had a lady from Windsor call me out the other day. And the video she was passing along was from Port Rowan. It was not from Leamington. Many of these, and I could anytime share videos and pictures that I have, many of these operations are bunk houses. Yes, they follow the, the square footage that each worker needs to have. And in our world where we have big houses and big space, this may not seem acceptable. But in Europe and certainly Central America, these living conditions or living spaces are are the norm so so we need to remember that that's not always the case we have certainly had any working condition living condition that is subpar if the municipality is notified we've taken action immediately fire building and so on hand in hand with the health unit so i just want to lay that out because there has been some discrimination against our growers who are doing their job they have workers that have been there eight to 14 years. And if their de the conditions were deplorable, these people would not be coming back. So, so that being said, testing. To my way of thinking, it's slow, it's steady, but in order to get our arms totally around this beast, we need, we need to put some incentives in place, if you will. I'm calling them incentives for lack of a better word or trying to not use a too strong of a word because then people rear back in fear and that's not my intention. Uh, I sent a text to the premier this morning suggesting that really he, he needs to up his game in relationship to this. I do think there are farms who are unwilling to test based on a whole lot of reasons, primarily the example this weekend when we had one of our big farms test or last weekend and then most of their farm was shut down so that that threw fear in the heart of many i get that but when i weigh weigh the scale of a business and a crop and multi-million dollars let's 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 be blunt and human lives i'm sorry but the human lives weigh heavier this is now about humanity this isn't about business and we need to take a hold of this we need to grab this bull by the horns and we need to get through the testing as soon as we can so that we get our numbers to zero the numbers uh, every day i get messages and texts oh the numbers are high well we knew that would happen we knew that when the testing was implemented there would be numbers much like long-term care it's no different than that the more testing you do the more numbers you get you just have to hang on tight till you get through it PIOC the provincial emergency group I'm glad they're here as you mentioned Mayor Dilkins I think we've needed to have one entity in charge 
bringing in all our partners. We have such talent within our, our organizations. We all share, we all share responsibility, but no one was chosen or ordered, if you will, to be in charge of it all. And so then you tend to have work in silos and, and things don't get done as efficiently as they could. So I'm very, very happy that the PIOC is here and I hope that they stay here for the duration till we get down to zero. I am concerned that if we don't have some kind of, um, shall we say, incentive, that our numbers will not go down for a long time. So that's another reason we need to push that. The isolation housing piece, again, thank you to the City of Windsor for really leading us and starting off. We certainly have, again, lots of partners working towards this. We now have, I believe, six hotels on board. And, and if you were watching any of the media, Bruce Power donated 50 pods to the municipality and they were set up on Monday. I called it our, our last resort. Ideally, you'd rather stay in a motel room where one or two people are, you know, bed and TV and patio or whatever you call that um, balcony. Um, that is ideal. But if our numbers get really, really high, we have a place ready. It's clean. It's air conditioned. There are kitchen facilities. There are showers. There's walking room. There's big TVs. There, there is. Um, a piece to that, that that we want to help with. And if, if we get there, we're on board. So I feel that we're, we're better than we were a week ago or two weeks ago. Are we where I wanna be? No, we're not. Can we be better? Absolutely. Are there people that need to take on more responsibility? You betcha. I'm not going to name them, but there are people that are passing the buck and that quite frankly needs to stop. And if it doesn't stop, I do believe the upper levels will come in and need to come in. So all that being said, thanks to all our partners, we're, we're so happy to see this regional effort to all of you, to, to the phone calls and the emails of support. Fantastic. I, I, I couldn't be more pleased. But please, please, please tell your people to still come to Leamington and Kingsville. I was contacted this morning by a uh, restaurant owner who said he's got a Windsor store. They're half what Windsor was. They have the same amount of space, actually more patio space. They're hurting. So please promote us to your people. That's what we need to do to get to, get to the new normal, but a successful new normal. That's what we need. So I'm not sure if I used up all my time or not, Dana, but uh, that's pretty much all I have to say. I don't like to repeat myself because council tells me that's one of my flaws. So that's it. And I thank you for this opportunity um, to, to be out there and showing that we're advocating. We advocate as, as much as we can with the premier as well. Minister Haidu is, is more than willing to listen. And we will not, we will not give up. Stage two is not the end, it's just a, a piece in the puzzle. And we will keep our eye on the ball till we get to where we need to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yolda, and thank you very much for all your advocacy and, and uh, your very articulate presentation. Uh, up next, I'd like to welcome the Kingsville, the town of Kingsville's mayor, Nelson Santos. And near the end of June on social media, Nelson, you wrote about the uh, involvement of upper levels of government at this critical time saying we are grateful for all the all hands on deck and support that our communities are seeing and that these communications uh, are certainly highly valuable and they are highly valuable discussions that we also need to highlight uh, much is needed and there are many updates going on and, and policy developments that will follow around international programs as well as housing and design reviews for housing needs and spaces for workers so I want to thank you for all your efforts and thanks for joining the call today and I'll turn the floor over to you. Okay, thank you, and it's uh, certainly a pleasure to be here, and and uh, obviously to to my, my neighbor and, and Mayor McDonald's uh, repetition sometimes is what we need to continue with that that messaging, so they they do hear loud and clear what uh, the direction and priorities you know continue to to come forward for us. So we don't mind echoing and helping carry that uh, that baton forward. Um, similar to um, to Hilda, I, I didn't prepare a lot of comments other than just trying to follow a, a track record of, of of how things you know started you know back into March and and all the protocols that have been put in place from different levels of government from the farms that uh, we're bringing in the, the temporary foreign workers from the different programs that are available. Um, we've identified. Uh, 
So a lot of the cooperation of these um, of our of our growers and and our farmers, traditional farmers, uh, greenhouse growers, wineries, uh, you name it, the industry of the agriculture has uh, an impact and has the need with uh, the with the temporary foreign workers, and it's a vital um, requirement. So so from the get go, you know, we were operating from from the municipal perspective, ensuring uh, the isolation uh, piece was provided for. Uh, our municipality uh, inspected up to fifteen uh, new locations uh, for uh, for these. Uh, workers coming in to ensure that they were um, isolated from the farm before coming into uh, into work. Um, that followed through really well. The growers were very cooperative. Uh, we identified uh, uh, additional discussions in terms of ensuring the, the workers were aware of, you know, what were the, the risks surrounding COVID-19 and how can we translate, you know, obviously our messaging that we've had from, from our health units uh, right through to all of our health experts, how can we translate it into a language, into a form that so they would understand. And uh, from, from day one, we brought, on other, brought in other partners. So uh, the Consul of Mexico was, was involved. They helped create some, uh, some forms and, and flyers. Uh, the Migrant Community Worker Program uh, teamed up with our community policing with the OPP. They created YouTube videos to have a different format to, to, to speak in their language in terms of you know, social distancing, uh, spaces, spacing. And, and, and I, I still have the, the comic uh, kind of uh, strip to kind of make it a little bit more relatable of Susanna Distancia. And uh, that's just basically a, a superhero tale, reminding you to keep your space uh, between between the workers and 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 individuals. So, uh, we've seen that effort go, but more continue to to, to need to be done. And um, we've had many discussions. Again, bringing more people to the table. Uh, the Ontario Growers uh, and Vegetable Growers (OGVG) uh, they've uh, provided uh, numerous updates, helping speak for some of the growers that uh, you know tend to not want to come into the spotlight. So they they like to do their work and and, and go about their business, uh, but they did come. Forward and identified a number of protocols that uh, even they were uh, putting forward in terms of um, uh, the workers coming into work being, uh, you know, temperature tested, going through the questions, ensuring they're feeling well before they come to work. And, and those protocols have been in place as well. So th there's a lot happening all at the same time and, and on many different channels. And when we look at uh, trying to resolve a, a lot of uh, the, the testing issues and challenges that we have now, uh, it's going to continue to take that collaboration. And, and uh, again, going for over the last six weeks, you know, we've seen a, a, an agri-sector group come together uh, with all of our partners and, and I'm grateful that uh, they're on the line with us as well from our, from our healthcare uh, professionals, uh, the, the health unit that, uh, you know, does step in and, and monitor a, a lot of uh, the assessments following any positive testing. Uh, there's so many hands on deck and trying to not cross paths or each other's boundaries. I think we've kind of erased most of that. Uh, we're in unprecedented times. So we've never experienced anything quite like this where, where we're sharing in, in the workload, we're sharing in the ability to respond. And uh, at this point, as you know, as many have spoken and, and, and Mayor Drew, you also referenced uh, obviously the need for an overall uh, partner for um, not just planning operations, but kind of uh, a go-to uh, person to help us ensure that all of our partners from the ministries, uh, both federal, uh, provincial, are, are in line and, and are not duplicating efforts. Uh, having uh, the EMO and, and PIOC come in and are asked to have them be a kind of our guide to, to keep us all you know, going forward and stronger, that continues to be our message today. So. Um, don't want to get into to too much more. I'll, I'll take off the Q and A. There's so much happening on, on the ground uh, as we speak with the additional testing even today uh, across farms. Uh, but the important part is that so you know we are responding. We have you know plans coming into place uh, from you know shelter isolation and protection and uh, the the health and, and wellness of the worker is is certainly at most a priority as well. So uh, that is all on our, our radar and uh, keeps us uh, quite busy uh, around the Zoom and around many rooms uh, across the county. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Nelson. Thank you for uh, being here with us today. Uh, Ross Mudpour is here. He's the CEO of the Erie Shores Healthcare and he's joining us on the line today. And Ross, you were heavily involved in the assessment center that was operated in our region and in the push to test farm workers. And in our call with Federal Minister of Health, you provided important information about the results of the testing as well as implications uh, of asymptomatic farm workers. So thank you for joining us today and I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Munford. Great, thanks uh, Mary Delkins and, and thank all of you for the attention you're paying to this uh, very serious issue facing our community. I'd like to give a quick summary of what Uri Shores Healthcare's involvement has been to date and our plans going forward. Um, at the end of May, uh, in response to growing concerns over the growth of cases and serious cases of COVID in our uh, agri-food worker population, we partnered with Essex-Windsor EMS and 
home and community care to develop an outreach program. Um, this field of health assessment team, as we call it, started to visit COVID positive workers wherever they may have been isolated, either uh, in their farm accommodations, in their usual housing or in motels or hotels. And this gave the workers an, an opportunity to report evolving symptoms and have a hands-on checkup, uh, really with an aim to prevent anyone from getting sicker without having the ability to, uh, uh, to access care. During this initial effort, our team really started to notice that when they visited a farm location, for example, they, there seemed to be more people there with symptoms suggestive of COVID than had been diagnosed or tested leading to that point. And, and that made us wonder if there was a reluctance to present, uh, to come forward with symptoms, or perhaps just a lack of ease of access to testing and care. And at the same time, many conversations with employers themselves were indicating that there was some interest in, in access to a broader testing initiative. And that led to our second initiative, um, for which we greatly expanded the number of, of collaborators to include the Windsor-Essex Community Health Centre, Windsor Regional Hospital, Hotel Dugrace Healthcare, the Biker Worker Co Community Partnership, and of course the Municipality of Leamington. And um, together we opened the Agri Food Worker Assessment Centre at the Shirk or Nature Fresh Centre in Leamington, and there we provided access on a on a booked basis with infection control practices in place to, to much larger scale testing that had previously been available through the assessment centers at the hospitals. Um, there was capacity for testing of upwards of uh, about 750 people per day. And um, we also combined that with access to hands-on assessments by a, by a physician or a nurse practitioner if anyone had uh, any symptoms. Um, as has previously been reported, Updated testing in that setting was, was a bit mixed. We had several uh, very proactive employers step forward and coordinate access to testing for their workers. Um, but others were still concerned over some perceived confusion over the implications of testing and specifically what would happen if a worker tested positive but no, had no symptoms and what was the implication for that worker and certainly what was the implication for the work itself. And so that facility, after testing about 900 workers, went dormant. Um, uh, we have uh, remained uh, um, quite willing to reopen that facility if indeed there was an increased demand for testing in that form. Uh, but simultaneously, Ontario Health asked us to pilot an attempt at on-farm testing, which we did with the same group of collaborators at two sites, and then handed that over to Ontario Health because of the resource intensity of that form of testing. And, and quite frankly, our focus our need to focus on the growing increase in overall patient volumes in, in usual patient volumes at the hospital. And so for now, we continue to work uh, and offer the field health assessment team for checkups for isolated workers. And we've worked uh, with Essex Windsor EMS to develop a model of medical supervision should, uh, should a specific COVID positive isolation site be created out of one of our local hotels. And uh, we remain at the table uh, with the uh, incident management structure in place to offer our voice and to provide local input and assistance wherever we can. We really remain wholly committed to helping increasing access to testing and care for everyone in our community. And the efforts for the agri-food workers in our community have brought us, quite frankly, you know, out of our comfort zone, out of our own four walls, but it's been uh, completely necessary uh, and important for us all to contribute what we can to the to the complex problem. Um, and I, I will say that it, it has been uh, heartwarming to see the efforts of all that local collaborators come together and, and as Mayor Santos said, really uh, put away the normal boundaries and, and step forward to do as much as we can. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll stop and, and pass it back to you, Mayor Duckins. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Moncourt. And, and finally, we're joined by Windsor Regional Hospital's President and CEO, David Mouché. And David, in many ways, uh, you have been at the forefront uh, of the fight against COVID-19 in our community. And when I think back to the meeting that you and I had at the St. Clair College Field Hospital the night before, you brought in the first positive cases there. And I look at where we're at today, it's truly uh, amazing to see how far we've come as a community. So I wanna take a moment to thank you uh, and the teams you lead for your efforts on behalf of the community. I appreciate you joining us today provide a hospital and healthcare perspective as part of this important discussion. Turn the floor over to you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Dilkins and fellow panelists. I want to start by saying thank you to all of Windsor-Essex. Your support during this pandemic's been, even for Windsor-Essex high standards, for coming together, nothing short of extraordinary. From drive-bys to food for staff to painted rock showing your support, your Windsor-Essex crowd was on display. Also, I need to thank Windsor-Essex for listening to and adhering 
to advice to self-isolate, social distance, practice proper hand hygiene, and now mask in public places. Our understanding of COVID-19 has evolved since January. The symptoms we thought at one time, fever, shortness of breath, and coughing, were the only signs of whether you possibly had COVID-19. That's evolved over time to clearly indicate a multitude of symptoms, and now the CDC estimates some 30% of COVID-19 being totally asymptomatic but infectious. At the same time, we saw how COVID-19 finds and attacks our most vulnerable, be it socioeconomical deprived individuals who cannot access healthcare in the United States, to our own long-term care retirement home and now agri-food workers. This has been called a war, our enemy attacks, our weaknesses. As a result, when faced with a vulnerable group in a congregate setting, we need to ensure there is substantial, immediate, and mass testing. Waiting for symptoms to develop before you start testing is too late. We saw that play out in long-term care retirement homes across the province and started to see it play out in agri-food workers. At the same time, you need to segregate the positives from the negatives, either cohorting in place or moving them to another location. Finally, you need to test negatives again and segregate the new positives from the remaining negatives. You keep doing this until negatives are truly negative. There's been published studies on this as a way to try to stem the tide of this pandemic. As a hospital, short of our inpatients and assessment centers, as Dr. Moncor indicated, we don't have the independent ability to test in general, the general community on our own. We have to be granted that authority through a provincial agency. That's what happened in long-term care retirement homes and also what started with the agri-food workers at the Nature Fresh Assessment Center. Currently, at Windsor Regional, we're experience like, experiencing, like many other hospitals, a pent-up demand of patients with medical issues. Our census in the hospitals at over 90%, this is even though we still have not pierced 60% of our pre-COVID surgery levels yet. We're noticing a 15% higher admission rate from the emergency departments and patients staying in hospital longer than pre-COVID lengths of stay by 10% or more or an extra day to two days per patient. This doesn't sound like a lot, but when you multiply that by the number of patients we typically see, this creates a demand annually for close to 100 beds, more. Clearly due to COVID, many patients are not able to seek primary care or were delayed receiving medical attention for some of their health care issues and we're starting to see that play out. A positive issue during COVID was our ability to continue cancer surgeries. Many hospitals had to stop cancer surgeries to create capacity because of the amazing work of our partners in the community and our team and with respect to patient flow, we are able to continue cancer surgeries and only we're going to postpone them if the surge arrives. Thankfully, through the work of our province and Windsor-Essex community, that surge has not happened. However, as our economy opens, we do not have to look far to see what happens when you stop pumping the brakes. Our neighbors to our north are experiencing COVID-19 numbers at staggering rates along with hospitalizations. Some of our neighbors brag about their lower death rates. However, death rates are a trailing indicator with respect to COVID-19. If infection starts and hospitalizations are up, unfortunately, deaths are inevitable. Our current battle in this war is to support our vulnerable sector agri-food workers. To do this, I focused on two things. Number one, as stated by many on this call, provincial federal ongoing support and leadership is needed. As we have all stated, the issue is complicated by many levels of government, ministries, and agencies involved. We need the province or feds to take the lead in this battle. You can see by this group, we are united on a local level and regional level to protect this vulnerable population and prevent possible community spread. Two, we need to get agri-food workers tested. We have to make this happen just like we're making it happen in long-term care retirement home employees and visitors who get tested. As stated, we cannot make this happen by ourselves. We need the power of the province and the federal government to make this happen. Yes, for agri-food workers, we can get lucky. We can sit back, let this play out, have herd spread immunity with minimal health impacts. However, that strategy has proven wrong with the three tragic agri-food workers deaths so far. 
We need testing to take place in agri-food workers like it's taking place for employees and visitors in long-term care and retirement homes. Again, I want to thank the Windsor Essex community for all and all our partners at this table, including EMS, Home and Community Services, Hotel Du Grace Healthcare, Local Health, Ontario Health Leadership, to name a few. We're ready for provincial federal leadership to help support the countless hours our teams have devoted to fighting this war. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, David. And I, I think certainly it's important that we were all able to come here together today to talk about uh, where our community is at, with respect to the COVID-19 crisis and the farm workers. And as I said earlier, we may be in stage two, but we are certainly not entirely out of the woods yet. And I think, David, you enunciated uh, some of the strong concerns that we have with respect to where we are and the activity that is and is not taking place. And we just know there's still a lot more work uh, to do. And so I'm certainly thankful to be a leader in my community and working alongside each and every one of you to help save lives and protect what is so important to all of us right here. Uh, with that, I'll turn the floor over to Dana for a media Q&A. Dana? Thanks very much, Mayor Dilkins. Again, members of the media, thank you for joining us today. If you do have a question for the panel, please use the Zoom, the Zoom chat to indicate, and I will call on you at that time. Our first question is coming to us from Dale Molinar at the CBC. Dale, please go ahead and enable your microphone. There, I guess uh, you can hear me now, right? Yes, very good. All right, hi, good morning, everybody. So I've been asked uh, to ask you guys, I think some of you kind of alluded to it, we're kind of wondering why the uh, Rick Nichols and uh, Dave Epp aren't here on this webinar and where they have where have they been in helping you folks uh, tackle this uh, issue? Uh, well, I'm happy to jump in and just say that they have been part of the conversations and certainly uh, easily accessible and, and available for the conversations. You know, it's one of the criticisms we get no matter what we do with respect to the Zoom sessions uh, uh, is that, you know, it's impossible you can't have two, the, the practicality of this is you can't have two screens of people uh, and hold a functional meeting. And so uh, we try and keep the numbers low here for this particular call, but any omission that you see uh, where there's someone you thought should be on this call is, is, is truly just in an effort to try and keep this group tight so we can have a, a good conversation in one hour uh, about the issues that are important. And all of the folks that you see on this call are part of many other tables. There are many other calls and Zoom meetings going on behind the scenes each and every day uh, that include some of the folks that you you uh, mentioned in your question, Dale. So they seem to be kind of silent though in, in this this whole conversation there. Do you, do you feel that you're a little frustrated with them or you know, do you feel like you're getting enough action from them? Go well, ahead. Go ahead. Thanks, I don't mean to jump jump in on you there, Mayor Drew. Um, Dale, I speak to them a minimum of three times a week. I just spoke again with Dave Epp last night. Um, they are our conduits and I use them. I'm sure um, Mayor Santos does as well. They, they speak for us, they get connections for us. And I need to add into that mix, Eric Kuzmerchuk, same thing willing and able to talk and work behind the scenes. You know, so many times it isn't about the sound bites and it isn't about getting your picture in the paper. It's about getting the job done. And these guys, these men are doing that for us. For me personally, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be doing what I'm doing without them. At the beginning it was answering questions and now there are conduit to the top. I'd like to know, uh, was someone brought up the, the idea of passing the book and, uh, with we realize that there's some good players and some bad players and who who is it that is responsible for inspecting these bunk houses or living conditions and saying okay and i mean we've had three or four months at this now what did this ever happen did, did, did someone go in there and say look you should have one person per room or whatever you know what who is it that was responsible for ensuring that that happened and had the teeth to uh, to oversee it. Well, I, you know, I'm I'm happy just to start off, and anyone else jump in if you'd like to add. But you know, this is part of the reason for this call is just to to let everyone know that we're asking for 
uh, additional support in terms of a leadership role from the Provincial Emergency Operations Center to come in and make sure that all efforts from all levels of government are being coordinated appropriately. Everyone on this call and those who aren't here, uh, the health unit, uh, the, Warden McNamara is the chair of the health unit, so they are represented, but you know, if someone has texted here in, in the chat, I see why isn't uh, the health unit here. Uh, you know, there are a whole bunch of players working together, but what we need is that lead coordinating role to make sure we're not duplicating efforts, to make sure that everyone is doing the right thing at the right time and that we're, we're really humming uh, along through a very complex uh, situation. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely a challenging time. Uh, and, you know, this, this, this response requires great coordination and it's not coordination that a group of us in front of you here today uh, can provide. Uh, it needs a higher level and higher order of government's support to make sure everyone is doing uh, what they're doing and that the tentacles reach far and deep into the government to make sure that the response is appropriate. And directly answering your question, Dale, every government has some responsibility. So the federal government sets the pathway for the temporary foreign worker program. They allow folks in with, the, with, with that program uh, and the visas that they grant. Uh, and they can put conditions on the, the farmers in terms of uh, living conditions and, and you know, the, 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 uh, the status of those conditions and, and, and mandating certain things that go on there. Of course, the provincial government is responsible for health, for agriculture, and for labor. Uh, and so they have a direct role as, as well. And so it's sort of like, you know, the old adage where they say the federal government has the resources, the province has the responsibility, and the cities have the problem. Uh, in many ways, that's the situation here, that at the local level, we are dealing with the effects uh, of, of what is going on, uh, but we need the support from the others to really make a dent uh, in the efforts and help us get over this hump. And all of us here, I think it's fair to say, if I said, does anyone have their eye on the ball for stage three? We're all gonna nod and say, yes, we, we hope to get there uh, in due course, but we have to be able to go through this and, and overcome uh, what you know some from the federal government, uh, the deputy prime minister, I think identified this as the worst outbreak uh, in our nation at this time. The federal health minister has called this a crisis. Uh, and so we need proper leadership on the ground that can coordinate a proper response and bring everyone together to make sure there's no duplication and then we get over this hump as quickly as possible. So the feds are the province, you think? I think they both have a role, Dale. And, uh, and, and so they both have a role to play and they need to coordinate that response to make sure that when they go on farms, they're doing the proper inspection as they do testing and making sure that the workers are safe and that the living conditions are appropriate. And I think Mayor McDonald is right. I mean, it's easy to paint all of these farm owners with one broad uh, stroke brush saying, you know, they're, they're, if they're a farm owner, somehow they're bad. That's not true. We know there are many good ones, uh, but we also know some of the living conditions on some of the farms are what uh, many would argue are the perfect vehicle for the spread of COVID because it's tight living conditions and congregate settings and, and the sharing of lots of, uh, uh, you know, bathrooms and kitchen areas and things like that. Warden? Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I just want to add to some of your comments, uh, Drew, as well. Uh, the, the pandemic has really exposed, I, I think, certain issues within uh, uh, within the um, the industry itself, that uh, um, all the different ministries that are involved, you know, Health Unit just started in January of this year, part of the response to do inspections. Uh, the Department of Labor, um, you know, the Ministry of Labor uh, provincially has a responsibility as well. And, and so it's not a question of pointing fingers that it's the federal government's uh, fault or, or, or the health unit's fault or the provincial government's fault, but there seems to be so many different jurisdictions that are involved that I think the pandemic has really um, exposed some of the, the, the weaknesses. And I think uh, post COVID, obviously we've got a lot of work to do to, uh, uh, to deal with that. But uh, to Mayor McDonald's comment, she's, ex she's, she's bang on when it, we can't paint everybody in the same brush and, 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 uh, uh, and so forth. There are many that are, uh, the accommodations uh, are, uh, are much better than others and, and, and so forth. Uh, so the jurisdictions themselves, in terms of the inspections, I think the leadership piece, I think at the end of the day, there has to be one common practice in terms of how um, we're gonna be housing uh, these, these workers, uh, certainly in the future. Dale, thanks very much for your question. 
Our next question is coming to us from Adele Loisel with Blackburn. Adele, go ahead, enable your microphone. Adele, open up your microphone. There we go. Unfortunately, it looks like we can't hear you, Adele. I'm sorry, we're going to have to move on to another, but we can try again in a bit, or feel free to type your question inside the chat. Our next question comes to us from um, Radio Canada. Please go ahead, enable your microphone. Yes, do you hear me? Yes, very good. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to have a statement in French, um, please, uh, about the aim of this meeting. Panelists, is anyone able to give a statement in French today? Monsieur Le Warden. <laughs> thank you. Je vais essayer de certainement de répondre à votre question. Si on regarde avec euh, le leadership dans, dans notre communauté, euh, les, certainement les, le leadership des, du gouvernement local, euh, certainement les, les, les agents de, de nos hôpitaux, euh, aussi euh, le bureau de santé, puis euh, tout est, certainement on a une crise ici avec euh, la difficulté qu'on a certainement dans, dans, sur, sur les fermes. Uh, qu'on a besoin de, de continuer à avoir un bon partenariat uh, pour essayer de, uh, de combattre certainement cette, uh, le, le COVID-19 qu'on a ici. Uh, puis c'est d'avoir certainement une, une, une conclusion, de travailler ensemble pour certainement avoir des résultats, pour aider certainement tous les, les, les travailleurs que, uh, sur les fermes ici. Uh, Aujourd'hui, si on regarde les, toutes les, 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 les leadership qu'on a, ici, uh, municipal, c'est certainement une collectivité de, de, certainement de tous les, uh, les, les différents secteurs de santé qui viennent ensemble pour certainement mettre le, 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 des experts uh, pour uh, aider uh, um, cette, uh, cette cette région que certainement ça a été élu avec le, le, le maire de, uh, de Windsor qui a dit c'est une crise ici uh, que uh, la plus grande augmentation des, des, des positifs du COVID-19 dans tout notre pays c'est travailler ensemble pour uh, faire uh, pour travailler ensemble pour, pour avoir des résultats pour aider certainement nos fermes merci je voulais également vous demander euh, Uh, sorry, uh, I, I wanted to ask you also, so um, apparently there are workers who don't work, who are not living on the farms. Um, so the houses where they live, are they inspected too? I, I, I don't know, I would, I would hazard to say no. Uh, that if they're not on a on a farm setting, but uh, but I really don't know the answer. I'm not sure if anyone does. Non, j'ai pas de j'ai pas de réponse pour ça. Certainement, uh, uh, c'est ça c'est quelque chose que il faut demander au, au ministre de, de certainement de, de travail ou bien certainement le bureau de santé. Merci. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to attempt once again Adele Loisel to see if uh, she believes that her microphone is sufficient. Adele, go ahead and give it a try. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, I am talking. Okay, perfect. So I wanted to ask, uh, first of all, how is the lack of federal or provincial coordination here, a lead agency, it sounds like what you want, how has that hurt efforts so far? Well, let me start and anyone else can jump in uh, as they feel is appropriate. But Adele, I, I would say that the local response has been good. There is good conversation and communication amongst all of the local partners to be able to deliver a response. And the, uh, emergency, the, the Ontario Emergency Operations Group is here. They have one or two reps on the ground here uh, and are helping to support some of the efforts. But don't forget, this is a... Uh, uh, a situation that has multiple levels of government involved uh, and requires 
a different level of coordination. Uh, and so we need to make sure, and there are some examples, and I, I won't go into it because I know what the headline would be tomorrow, but there are some examples where, uh, you know, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing, and there are things happening out there uh, that, you know, uh, would be much better if there was a, a, a someone from the government of Ontario leading the effort to make sure that all of the partners are brought together in a responsible, reasonable way, uh, and that the proper resources can be drawn from the provincial government and perhaps the federal government uh, to address the situation we see on the ground. Uh, and so everyone is doing the best they can do uh, locally, uh, but this type of situation requires a different level of coordination because of the complexity involved. All right, just uh, going off of that, you mentioned that the left hand doesn't seem to know what the right hand is doing. And I know you don't want to get into spe specifics, you say, because you know what the headline would be tomorrow. But when you mention something like that, I am going to ask for some example. Is it simply that maybe there's duplication or are there holes in the system or how, how is this, uh, I guess, uh, be taking place? I would just say that the response is not necessarily as coordinated as it should be or can be. Uh, and what we want to do is make sure that there are no gaps, uh, that if you are, you know, let me just give you an example. If you are going to house migrant workers in a hotel, a part of the requirement for the isolation is that they actually stay in the room and are, are, are undertaking proper isolation. Well, that requires someone to actually show up and provide meals to them three times a day. Uh, and so if there is not proper coordination and if a meal is being missed, uh, most human beings are going to get hungry and they're going to leave their rooms to try and find uh, something to eat. Uh, and so it could be simple things like making sure that all of the meals are being delivered uh, on time and appropriately. Uh, and it can also be making sure that in terms of isolation and recovery, uh, that we're not tripping over each other, trying to provide a response. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, we all have a shared goal. Uh, and we want to we want to solve this situation, but we, we shouldn't be tripping over each other, trying to um, undertake efforts that would be better delivered if there was one lead organization with ultimate responsibility. And because so much of this funnels back into the healthcare system uh, through either Ontario Health, the Ministry of Health, that is why we feel that the provincial government has a uh, an obligation, frankly, to play a leading role uh, in the with, through the Provincial Emergency Operations Center uh, to help lead the recovery here. So you would say that you would prefer the province takes the leadership role as, to, as opposed to the feds? Do you have, I guess, a preference? Well, I, you know, I, I think the province can certainly uh, provide the response that's required because what we're talking about here and what I heard almost every single person talk about uh, is the need for more testing and making sure that the testing is, is going on and then that isolation and recovery options are available. Uh, and so... Uh, there are lots of efforts by all of the partners to do the right things, uh, but it really requires, this would the response would be, let me put it this way, the response would be much stronger, much more efficient and effective if there was a provincial lead uh, taking the role as the leader in the emergency response that we see. Mayor McDonald? So Warden, uh, Mayor, Mac, uh, Mayor McDonald, uh, feel free to jump in. You know what, I'll it, let uh, Mayor McDonald, she's been trying to get in, I'll, 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 I'll just defer, but I, I do have a comment. Thank you. Um, Adele, I, I've said from not the beginning, but once we got into this situation we're in now, I believe it should have been the federal government uh, that, that was the overseer. We would have had uh, an across the country national policy, much like the U.S. after 9-11 had the homeland security. They're, they're the first and the last word on what goes forward. And, and, and I agree to a degree with Mayor Dilkins, but it's the feds that opened up the border. They're the ones that closed it to the rest of us, opened the border for the offshore workers to come in. They should have followed through, which they didn't. Had they followed through, we wouldn't be in this mess. It wouldn't be up to municipal governments to try and find a way to coordinate this. They're also in charge of the temporary foreign workers, so they should have seen that all the way through. And, and I believe at the end of this, when, when we reach a new normal, there will be a dissection of this and there will, there will be changes. 
the portion that the, the province should be in charge of, I agree with the health component, but they're also in charge of the seasonal agricultural workers. So they too would, would have a piece of it. It should have been done by then because we have too many, again, as I said before, entities that are doing what they need to do and nobody's going together. It's, it's like the who's on first, whoever's on second kind of thing. Well, it's not my job, it's his job. And he's saying, no, it's your job. Had you had one entity saying exactly what needed to be done, it'd be smooth sailing, they would have said first and last and we'd be there. That would be to me what should have happened in an ideal world, could have happened but didn't. Thank you, Adele. Being conscious of time, uh, we have three more questions being posed. This one comes to us by text from Gord Bacon. I, I just don't want to <laughs> leave you out. If you want to jump in, feel free. Forgive me. Well, very, very quickly, um, I totally agree that there has to be a coordination where uh, information flows. This, what's unique about this situation we have today, it's multi-governmental. It, it's, 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 it's municipal, provincial, and federal uh, all at once. To make it simple, just go back to a, a municipal emer declared uh, emergency. Usually you got your CEMC and all the agencies respond to the CEMC and they coordinate. What are your needs? All of that information. That's where PIOC makes a lot of sense because at the end of the day, we're in a situation here where when you exhaust all your infrastructure within the municipal level, they're the ones that can coordinate the, the atom. What can you bring in? The military or any other uh, requirements that you need. And, and, and so, that, that to me is the key piece. They have the wherewithal to bring in the additional resources that we need once we've exhausted everything at this uh, at the bottom end. We're getting pretty close to that now. And, and if we are to deal with the mass testing and everything else that's required on those farms, um, we just don't have uh, the full resources uh, at hand. And so PIOC, you, the information flows up to them. It's kind of the basic pyramid that we have on, under a simple, emergency within a municipality that should be the same context here because of the multi uh, discipline that we have we've got federal government uh, and, and we've got the, uh, the province and the municipal governments all involved in an industry uh, and, and dealing with a, a, a world pandemic I think the coordination piece Mayor McDonald said it well um, it, it, it has to be one identified individual that gathers all of that information coordinates it and, and where the needs need to be met, it goes through that channel. Thank you, Warden. Our next question from Gord Bacon. In his opening remarks, Mayor Dilkins mentioned a need for long-term solutions for issues with seasonal or migrant worker housing. Why has it taken a pandemic for this kind of response when groups like Justice for Migrant Workers have been advocating for change for such a long time? Thank you. Well, I, I, I'm, you know, you're referring to comments that I made. Let me just say that I, I really don't have uh, any material farms or farm workers that I'm aware of, like farm settings uh, in the city of Windsor. There are some south of the airport on the land that we uh, acquired a number of years ago, but it's not an issue from a city perspective uh, that we touch uh, ever, uh, quite frankly. And so the pandemic, uh, in I, I think everyone on the call would agree that the pandemic has exposed frailties and weaknesses of every system. I mean, that's just what a, something like this does. Uh, and so when that is exposed, uh, and when you have a global pandemic, you can see that congregate living, you can see that uh, it exposes some of the, the, the bad actors, especially because uh, the, the living conditions are tighter and, and it becomes more of a perfect vehicle for the spread of COVID-19 in places like that. Uh, and then when you see the spread happen, then it starts impacting the broader region. It's not just Kingsville and Leamington, uh, it's the entire region because as was enunciated by, by at least a couple folks on this call, people travel back and forth. It's not just farm workers living in Leamington and going to work on a, on a, in a greenhouse or a farm there, they're getting in a, in a car and uh, many are traveling back and forth between the city, between the warden's territory, between Nelson's territory, uh, every municipality in Essex County. Uh, and so we have a shared interest here 
Uh, and, you know, obviously this type of thing, when it happens, when you hear the words crisis come from the federal health minister, it puts a spotlight on the situation that then, you know, uh, groups come out and they say, yes, we've been talking about this for a long time. So it, it's great that Justice for Migrant Workers is, is uh, still out there uh, beating the bushes and, and rattling the cages and getting attention to a very important uh, situation that I think, you know, becomes more, the spotlight becomes brighter at times like these. Uh, when there are when there are problems, especially a global pandemic, where you have the spread of a virus like this through settings like that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gord. Our next question comes to us from Rich Garten of CTV. Rich, go ahead and enable your microphone. Thank you. Hey there. Uh, this question is from Mayor McDonald. Um, you mentioned incentives. Uh, I'm just curious if you can elaborate on that a bit more. What you mean by uh, incentives exactly? Well, I, I was referring to conditions of employment in order to make testing, uh, it, testing happen. I think there needs to be um, a coordination with the growers that they have incentive, incentives to, or there should be initiatives or whatever you want to call them to make the growers acquiesce, if you will, to testing on the farm. I understand their fear, but there needs to be some kind of either a carrot or a stick to say you have to have your farm tested. Same with, with, the, with the employees. And I'm, now I'm going to speak of, of the, um, the ones that come from offshore in particular. A lot of them are very afraid. So we, we need to bring in, and we're working at this already, bringing in clergy that are uh, Spanish, bringing in other folks, not just interpreters, but that folks that can get the nuances of, of the language, between the two languages to help them understand what the advantage is of, of being tested. So those are the kinds of things I'm talking about. But I'm also talking about the upper levels saying, you have to do this, whether it's a condition of employment. And, and that's what I mean, no one seems to want to take that. It, it's a prickly issue and no one needs, seems to want to take that on, but someone needs to. If we don't get somebody to do this, we'll just keep going around in circles on and on and on and we'll never get there. So somebody needs to say, look, you either do this or you're going to get fined. Look, we're going to do this and you will get the testing done. Look, pat on the back, whatever the incentive is, there has to be something, a carrot or a stick, basically. And, and, and so let me just uh, uh, amplify what Mayor McDonald just said, because one of the calls that we've been on very recently uh, the federal government talked about 3,000 plus more uh, temporary foreign workers coming to Canada. Now, I can't tell you with precision how many will end up in Essex County, uh, but I think it's fair to say it, it would be uh, a fair number of folks who would end up uh, coming here as well. And so you have that added level of complexity uh, that these folks will have to self-isolate for two weeks when they arrive. They'll need a place to do that, a place that isn't uh, infected. Uh, and that requires coordination. That requires coordination so that we know how many will be coming here so that we can prepare the isolation and recovery areas uh, and make sure that we're separating positives and negatives and that, that you know, the right thing is being done in advance so we don't bring folks here, put them in a mixed setting and then infect a whole new group of folks. So uh, that's the type of thing that is happening where you really want to, everyone here would want to do the right thing, but unless you have all of the information and understand the timing of when this when this stuff is happening, you aren't able to provide the most robust response. Thank you for your question, Rich. Our final question comes to us from Mark Ribble of South Point Sun. Mark, please go ahead and enable your microphone. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, just given the kind of moderately high numbers yesterday on positive tests that were reported, how close does everyone think that we are to exceeding what the hotels can handle and moving into the isolation centers in Windsor and Leamington. I, I'm, I'm smiling and I have a response and then the warden please jump in. It, it's so difficult to answer that question because this is why from a provincial perspective, if you can get a coordinating body that will coordinate and, and share the information on the tests that are being done, the timing of those tests, uh, the number of folks that will be tested, then the back end work can be done to make sure that hotels are available, recognizing that most of the hotels here in Essex County, uh, Windsor and Essex County, were likely in still single digit occupancy. Uh, except, you know, 
for normal hotels, those that have been rented out to deal with this situation, obviously a different story, but um, that, that just, your question really punctuates the need to have some sort of provincial response leading uh, the coordinating effort. And, and David and Warden, please jump in. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, I think I'm going to just make it very simple. You've got eight to ten thousand migrant workers or farm workers. I believe it's farm workers in uh, 176 farms. And if you look at the numbers that have come through in some of the farms, and if you aggregate the, uh, those numbers, it, you can see why the numbers potentially, I'm not saying they are, but potentially could exceed. Uh, the capacity that's required uh, to house them. And so this is why, uh, you know, we keep going back to that coordination piece. I think it's, it's extremely critical. I mean, uh, so I'll keep it at that. Just you look at the amount of numbers that are there. If you look at traditionally the ones that have been tested so far, and if you look at the numbers that have been, uh, been exposed uh, as positive, um, you could see the numbers could be a lot higher than, than the capacity to, uh, to house. Go ahead, David. Yeah, and our concern, that's why you've heard from everyone on this call, is our need to escalate the testing efforts. Is unfortunately, unfortunately, the longer you wait with respect to testing, the more, if there is some positives, they start multiplying and they'll multiply into great numbers, just like we saw with respect to the one farm. If you jump on that two, three weeks ago, you might not be in the position they're in now or we're in. Um, so as a result, again, we don't know what we don't know. When we've only tested approximately a third of the 8,000, let alone the additional thousands that are coming in, we're doing our best with respect to the estimations we have based upon those numbers but those numbers can change rapidly in the sense of once it starts and it gets into a farm, it multiplies in those vulnerable settings. So I wish there was a clear answer, but the clearest answer is get the testing done. Then you get a snapshot of what you're dealing with and you go from there. But if you're doing it on a very slow basis, then your estimations are just as good as your estimations. You're almost better playing black or red at roulette. Thank you. If any panelists would like to add anything to the final question. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. That concludes our webinar. Thank you very much for making the time and thank you media for joining us. The link to this conference will be available on the City of Windsor's Facebook page should anyone wish to re-watch or share with anyone who might have missed out today. Stay safe everyone and thank you very much for joining us today. <laughs>